bring to it, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. Metro Heights. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Boom. Um, today, uh, today has been an incredible day. My heart is full of joy, honestly. Seeing uh, the Kazis up here uh, just wrapping their arms around this region, dreaming. I can see, I can see John's eyes already, just scheming and planning and believing in each and every one of you. Um, of course, it's so amazing to have our parents of the faith, the McKeans, here. And, uh, you know, such an honor. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, just the, the level of care that, that Kim and Elena have for every region, every church in the world that we've got is, is incredible. Um, and uh, just very grateful to have you here today. Um, the title of my lesson today is very simply, The Fight of Our Life. Ooh. Wow. The fight of our life. Come on, bro. Take a look with me here in Judges. Come on. Come on right. Chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 1 of the book of Judges. Now, a lot of people um, don't know this, but, but the Hebrew word for judge could also be translated as leaders. leaders. So, in a way, this is the book of leaders. Are you with me? And uh, it's great to have so many amazing leaders with us today. Obviously, we already talked about the, the Kazis and the Keens, but, but I really want to take a second to lift up Prince and Joy. Yeah. Oh. Well, well, I love this couple. I mean, we, we were together last night and had a great tea time until like almost midnight. Uh, but just, just his humor, his love, his conviction, his zeal. Uh, joy has grown so much. Uh, that's joy. Um, you know, but not only uh, Princeton and Joy, it's, it's great to have uh, my daughter, one of my daughters in the faith, Michelle here. Uh, with her interest, Mario. Uh, still keeping an eye on him. Uh, but uh, all jokes aside, they're doing an incredible job. It's just delightful to see them pulling the, uh, all of the Latin ministry together in a powerful way. And we have big dreams for the Latin ministry. So, as you know, we have one sector, uh, one full Latin sector in OC. This represents a Latin house church, which we believe can become a Latin sector. And, and the dream is that this is the beginning of having a Latin sector in every region. Uh, but we want to start off by at least a Latin sector in every, in every super region. And then get down to every region. LA is about 50% Spanish people. And, uh, and we've got to go after that community in a big way. Come on, uh, so I'm very excited uh, just to see that how the Latin ministry is now raising up the leadership, uh, getting behind uh, Mario and Michelle, making them into the leaders that, that you always wanted so that we can send them somewhere else. Uh, it's very grateful for you guys and uh, in your hearts. Um, it's, uh, it's always great to be with uh, Rico and my other daughter in the faith, Janelle. Woo! First, the first week that we, we knew her, we, uh, she, she was living with uh, Leanne and I in Long Beach uh, on the mission to planting. And uh, this lady can fight. Yeah. Yeah. This lady can go. Yeah. And uh, I'll never forget, uh, you know, Janelle was like, she's, she was very young. How old were you at that time? <laughs> no, physically. She's like 18 years old, right? Like, and now she's got this like dad figure in a small house. I mean, it was, it, it was, it was tough for her. You know what I'm saying? So she was letting me know, like, hey, you know, give me my space. Yeah. And uh, and uh, she was like a little disrespectful a couple times. And so without without really like getting my ducks in a row, like talking to Leanne or the McKeans or anybody, I was just like, hey, Janelle, you gotta be respectful. Yeah. And Leanne was looking at me like, I don't think she was disrespectful. Cool. And, uh, and then Janelle sees the disunity between us, and like this goes after it, and then calls the McKeans, and suddenly I'm in a tea time apologizing. <laughs> and uh, I was like, this is never going to happen again. <laughs> never going to happen again. So I got my text in a roll. And, uh, and the next time Janelle was like kind of wanting her space and, you know, sorting me out a little bit. Um, <laughs> You know, this time I had my ducks in a row. Leanne was with me, the McKeans were with me. And Janelle's like so, so uh, emotionally intelligent, she could detect that. Yeah. 
And, uh, and she knew that, that I had my ducks in a row this time. And, and I said, you know, I, I want to be the leader of this household. But I promise you this. If anything comes through that door in the middle of the night, I will be the first one to protect you. If you need anything, I'll be there for you. And, and Janelle, who I had started to think was like a really tough sister, <laughs> became like the sweetest daughterly woman that I've ever met in my entire life. And, I, 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 and that's who she is to me. That's who she is to me. Um, you know, um, uh, one brother I'm so proud of and who I love so much is, uh, is Jermaine. Oh, oh, hi, Jermaine. My name for him is Jermaine Tan. <laughs> and uh, when we were doing our preaching class here in the uh, in the south, we had there in the uh, Southland, former Southland, we had the uh, we had a, uh, a preach off, and uh, one of the things we were looking for was range. So you had to preach at like a one on ten, and then preach at like a two on ten, and then get it up to like a ten on ten. And Jermaine was absolutely undefeatable <laughs> at a at a ten pitch preaching the word of God. Were you ever were you ever in seated? Yeah. yeah. Mario by one. By Mario, by, by one. Yeah, because you can do the one better. Mario you can hit the one better. But nobody could hit the ten better, and that's why we call him Jermaine Ten. <laughs> uh, so many other amazing brothers and sisters. But but we're gonna look now at our at our spiritual brother, um, Gideon. Come on. Remember that when we look into the scriptures, we are we are looking at our family history. This, this book, although it is clean and beautiful and nicely bound and we get to, to just open it up and buy it for about 15 bucks down at the Christian bookstore, is actually a book that's covered in blood. It's, it's covered in the tears of the amazing brothers and sisters, the saints, who wrote these words inspired by the Holy Spirit and, and, and gave their lives so that we could have it. They believe that the scriptures we're going to read today were worth dying to get to us. Are you with me? And so as we, as we read these, these words today, let's try to take on board whatever God is trying to teach us with this family history of ours. Are you with me? In Judges chapter 6, starting in verse 1, the Bible says, The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And for seven years, he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. So this is, this is fascinating. The former leader, who we know to be, who was the judge before Gideon? Deborah. The former leader, who, who, the former judge, who was Deborah, had, had inspired Israel and liberated Israel from its enemies. She, she often lamented, I wish, I wish the brothers would step up to the plate. Oh. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, it was, it was very fascinating. You know, Barak, whose nickname means uh, lightning, yeah. was one of the guys that she spoke to. She said, Barak, you're a prince, dude. Yeah. Gather the army and go and fight the war. Come on. And he said, Deborah, I'll only do it if you come with me. <laughs> but I'll come with you. And we don't know what Deborah said to Barak, who, who in every way was one of those guys who had a nickname that, that was totally inappropriate. <laughs> because he was not lightning at that time. Right. We, we don't know what she said to him on the way to that battle. Ooh. But the Bible says that he came charging down that hill in front of the troops. And all the guys rallied in behind him, and Israel had a great victory. Yeah. We don't know what she said to him, but she put that guy in a spiritual place to lead Israel in an amazing way. Yeah. She, she passes on, and then comes a time of great hardship. Now, some might, might correctly know that in Numbers 25, the Midianites are wiped out by Moses. So what are the Midianites doing back? Well, the scripture says that Moses sent the army of Israel out to, to take care of the Midianites who had, who had tempted the people in the incident of the Battle of Peor. 
But what's noted in that scripture is, is 12,000 of these troops came back with Midianite wives. And so it's very likely, many scholars believe, that those wives actually enticed their husbands, instead of truly becoming Israelites, those wives enticed their husbands back to becoming Midianites, yeah. except now they're not completely Midianites. They're, they're, they're Midianites who are like half Jewish, yeah. tougher, a tougher problem. And then this problem that, that had not been fully taken care of, just like all problems, all sins that you don't fully repent of, yeah. Yeah. come back a thousand times tougher next time. Come, on, talk about it, bro. come back and totally subjugate Israel for seven years. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Can you imagine? That life is so bad down here, and the bad guys have come in, that we're all living up in the San Bernardino Mountains and the Los Angeles National Park. That's, that's the situation exactly that the Israelites find themselves in. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined all the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them or their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. Now can you imagine? For seven years, they did not cry out to the Lord for help. Come on, Tim. Wow. That, that's tough. That's yeah, that's intense. Are you with me? Yeah. yeah. You ever have a problem that like that like seems insurmountable? And and you go after it, perhaps with all your heart. And then someone comes to you and you're like, hey, how are you doing? And you go, oh man, I got this issue. It's really tough. And they go, did you pray about it? Come on. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Come on. I should have prayed about it. Yeah. 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 Well, for seven years, they didn't go to the Lord. But finally, after seven years, they finally get down on their knees and they go, God, we cannot handle this ourselves. We need you. Man. The situation is terrible. Now some might say, bro, why, why look at this scripture this morning? This is a great historical scripture. I'm not sure it has anything to do with our situation. Yes. I believe it does. Come on, bro. As we look out on this broken, godless world, full of sin, and chaos, and pain, we can have the same attitude that these Israelites have. It's just life. That's the way it is. As a movement, we are a family that has stood up, and in the name of God, we say, the situation is not acceptable. Yeah. We do not tolerate this world situation. Yeah. We're going to fight, and we're going to do something oh, about it. Are you guys with me? Yeah. Yeah. Now, the people cry out to God. Now, keep in mind, as we're going to see a little bit later, they don't destroy their idols. They still have their idols. You ever, you ever, you ever have a little pet sin? Oh, man. Just a little pet, little, just a little kitten. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's not a lion. It's just a little kitten sin. Yeah. Are you with me? Uh, I'm trying to do more, but I just. Come on. Daddy, let me keep my kitten. Are you with me? Yeah. Well, the pe that's where the people were at. They're crying out to the Lord, but they're keeping, they're keeping precious. <laughs> Come on, bro. And so God sends them a prophet. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. So can you imagine? This guy shows up and goes, Hey, I am a prophet from God. God has heard your cry. Gather together. Get in nice and close. Come on. I want to tell you God's response. Are you ready? This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of a land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians. 
I delivered you from the hand of your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. But you have not listened to me. Drop the mic. Can you imagine? God, God has given you his answer. You made your bed, now sleep in it. Oh my gosh. Okay. And? And you're going to liberate us. I, I, he didn't say anything more. He said something about make your bed, you made your bed, something to sleep in it. Dude, you, you can't be serious. Stay, stay in there. Did you say anything else? Did any of the words come to you? That's it, man. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> but we know that when we cry out to God, God always listens. Come on. In verse 11, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under an oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abysrite. Where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. So here, an angel of the Lord comes down. You're threshing your wheat in a wine press. An angel of the Lord comes down and greets you as a mighty warrior. Now, now, let's think about this, because I think that for a Hebrew person reading the scripture, there's certain things that would pop out of them. But perhaps, don't jump out at us the same way. Mm-hmm. Who's ever seen a, a threshing floor for, for wheat? It's about, the, it's about, oftentimes it can be about the size of a uh, basketball court, or up to two basketball courts. Okay. Are you with me? Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, how is it used? Well, you take all your harvest, all your wheat, you lay it down over the ground, and then they have this nunchuck looking thing, and you get a bunch of guys in there, and you it's a long stick with a little chain and another stick, and they and they whack the ground. You follow me? Yeah. Okay. Then as the wind comes along, you take a big, a big fork and you throw the wheat up in the air, and what happens? The the, the chaff is blown away, and what's left on the ground? The wheat, right. Now, the sisters that come along and take these mounds of wheat, and then they do it on like a little mini scale on these little, on these little uh, plates. And then you end up with just the kernel of wheat, which you then put into a bag. A few grown men can fill a wall with wheat in a day. You then bring in more wheat and more wheat and more wheat, and then you take 10, 15, 20, 30 wagons, and you take this all to market where you sell it, and you have your money for the year. Are you with me? Yeah. What pops out to you that you have a man threshing his wheat harvest in a wine press? Not much of a harvest this year. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Why is he doing it? He's doing it to hide it from the Midianites who would come and steal from him. But also, he just doesn't have much of a harvest. Right. Who's ever seen a wine press? So a wine press, like a, it's like a jacuzzi. It's got little holes on the bottom. And you put the grapes into the jacuzzi, and then you have people who get into it, God willing, they wash their feet, and etc. And they dance around, they got drums, and they dance around, and then into, out, out from the little holes comes the juice. You then take that, you add, you know, fermenting aging, you get up the wine. Are you with me? Yeah. So here you have a man who's threshing his annual harvest in a wine press out of fear of the Midianites. And an angel comes down to him at this moment and addresses him as a mighty warrior. My question for us this morning is, how's our harvest been this year? How's our harvest been this year? We can, we can fall into the thinking of the Israelites, which is, this is just the way it is. Mm-hmm. Or, or we can accept our birthright, which is to have all the land, 
and be abundantly fruitful. Come on. And to have a life where our best fruit is not stolen by Satan. I'm sure all the disciples here would agree. Wouldn't it be nice to go back and not have made those dumb decisions that we made? Yeah. 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 I mean, what if what if you could just get all the money back from every dumb decision? Oh, yeah. And we just put it in your account today. Would that be amazing? Yeah. But but all of that was stolen from us by Satan. Wow. Yeah. And you got this guy who's there. He doesn't know better. This is this is the only life he's ever known. He has no vision for himself. When he's addressed this way, he can't even understand it. Wow. Are you with me? Yeah. Let's take a look at his response. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. What's, what's Gideon's response? He goes, God, like, I am the weakest in my family. I'm nobody. And my family's not much to speak of. Why, why are you talking to me? What kind of impact can I have? God has abandoned us. This is just the way it is. I believe that many disciples... Just like our, our dear brother Gideon, who we'll see up in heaven. Just like our brother Gideon, many disciples can have exactly the same attitude. Yeah. We have been lied to by the world. We have begun to think that how many friends we have on Facebook, our education, our credit report, where we live, who our parents were, yeah. is who we are. Yeah, well, well, thank you. But I'm here to tell you today, that those things cannot tell you who you are. I dare say even you cannot tell you who you are. But only God can tell you who you are. And God sees each person in here as a mighty warrior. Wow, that's a, that's a great point, bro. That was, that was a great point. I, I hope your name heard that. But it's not talking about me. You're right. I am talking about you. That's, that's who you really are. Amen. You know, in the darkest days of the fall of the ICUC, I'm watching the church tear itself apart. Horrific time. I had been baptized into this amazing, amazing, wonderful church. Like, oh my gosh, like all the truth in the universe has been opened by eyes through the Bible. Is that amazing? Yeah. My, my dad's a, a doctor of philosophy. And so from like a very young age, he would like argue with me and test me and talk to me about the world and his, his like pretty humanistic thinking about, about the world. Right. And, it, and it confused me and, and darkened me. And I, I had many questions. I had so much, so much I wanted to know about the world, but, but I was so gnarled up and in, in retrospect pretty wicked. Right. And when I discovered the Bible and all the answers are right here, it brought so much joy. And not only that, but, but we have this amazing family around us. And then, foolishly, through ridiculousness, we decided to set the Bible aside and, and go Satan's way and tear each other apart. To not be torn apart. So in defense of ourselves, to kill everyone else. Wow. And, and, and what, what a chaos. Like, how can any, any travesty of that level not be satanic? Right. And I'll never forget, um, I just started to find myself going on to, I've been in the military, and I was doing my degree in political science, going on to the, uh, the, the Canadian Army recruitment webpage. Wow. 
and just like looking at it. I, I didn't even really know why at the time. And then I started looking at the, uh, the you know, the Canadian uh, uh, Intelligence Service, you know, webpage. Nice. Oh, I speak English and French, and ex-military, I put a science degree. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go and be an agent all over the world. I started dreaming about it. Come on! Uh, and, and then, I, I just, one day, I don't know what happened, I, I, I came to work, I had, had a, a quiet time in the morning, and, and I started going on that stupid website again. <laughs> and I go, this is, this is a shame. I just got baptized three, four years ago. And, and I've now completely given up on the kingdom of God. And, and now I want to get my dreams and aspirations met somewhere else. And I, and I prayed a special prayer. I don't even know if I've even remembered this until recently. I don't know how many people I've shared this with. Montana. But I, I, I prayed a special prayer. I said, God, I don't want to be working for these people. I want to be your agent in the kingdom of God. Come on. And, and about, honestly, about two days later is when I called Kip the first time. And, and I called so many leaders to talk about what was happening in the church. And everybody's response was, this is just the way it is. This is the new, this is the new blue. Right. This is what it is. And Kip, I called him, I left a message, I resigned myself that I'd probably never hear from him. He called me back within 15 minutes. Wow. And invited me to Portland wow. to meet and talk with him. And explain to me the situation of what was happening in the world. And even though he had never seen me before, invited me to Portland because he's like, bro, you gotta come to Portland. We gotta band together. Great things are gonna happen. Right. Why, why, why am I important in this? <laughs> but but without seeing me, in some way, God spoke through him, saying, You are a mighty warrior. Come on, come on. Come on. I wanna I wanna challenge every single person in this room to drop the lies that you've been told about who you are. As a church right now, there is no greater need than for brothers and sisters to step up and be mighty warriors. There's no greater need than for brothers and sisters to step up and go, hey, this harvest that we've been having is not good enough. This is not acceptable. It's not okay to be up in the mountains. Right. We've got to pour down into the valleys. Yeah. We've got to go after the entire area yes. of Southern California. Yes. We've got to evangelize every college. We've got to evangelize every neighborhood. Yeah. We've got to evangelize our family, yeah. our friends, everybody we know. Right. And God is with us, and God is going to give us an incredible victory. Yeah. What has to change in your thinking? Before you go to bed tonight, I want you to write down five. This is a big homework. Yeah. Yeah. Five kingdom dreams that involve you. Come on. Your Bible talk, your region, your ministry, your bachelor's with the ICCM, whatever it is. And make a decision to become a leader in the city of Angels Church. Right. You know, my, my mom calls me once in a while, and I love my mom, but... She called me once in a while and she'll, she'll say like little oblique comments about the church or, or whatever. And I, and I always have the same response for years. I go, Mom, there is no them. I am them. I am them. Come on, Tim. This is my church. You're talking to the church right yeah. now. That's who, that's who you're talking to on the road right now. I'm a disciple. I'm a Christian. I'm in the kingdom of God. This is my family. I'm fighting for it. I would fight for it paid. I would fight for it unpaid. I'd fight for it in LA. I'd fight for it anywhere in the world we go. Why? Because this is the fight of my life. Everyone believes that you're in the fight of your life. I'm not sure everyone believes it. Do you do you believe right now that you're fighting for your children? Yes. Do you believe right now that you're fighting for the brother or sister next to you? Yes. 
This is the fight of your life. You might be waiting for some other fight. It won't come. The darkness is going to come. The end of the movie is going to come. Whatever position that God has put you in right now, it's the fight of your life. And God is watching, and the angels are watching. And as, as exciting as it was to see the crew blow up the first three games of the... You guys remember? The first three games of the, of the, of the basketball league. Like, dominate the first three games in an incredible way. And your cheering section, led by Janelle, was like a force of nature. You know what I'm saying? That, as exciting as that was, I mean, I, I was so proud of the crew watching that. I just the, the cheering, the excitement, just the, the unity, how people were going to conquer it. I was like, this is the standard. And then it raised all the other super region yeah. standards. Yeah. They all found their own Janelle and got a little cheering section, etc. That is 1% of what the angels are doing in heaven right now. Come on. As they look down on the battle that we're in. I don't know about you. I'm in the fight of my life. My wife's here. My children are here. My family's here. This is this is not a casual time for me. I'm not taking this easy. Are you with me? Yeah. And and I want to call everyone here, if you've not been in this fight with us, to join this fight with us. Come on. Yeah. The scripture goes on. Um, Gideon goes back to his town, smashes some idols, angers everybody. He then, he then blows on the trumpet and he calls all of Israel and goes, guys, the war is on. It's time to come down out of the villages. It's time to take these Midianites and kick them out of our home. And, and out of all the Israelites, remember, they're up against a million plus enemies. Are you with me? 30,000 warriors Reply. Oh, wow. That's like that's like having Bible talk and like one guest shows up. Yeah. Oh, man. Like, let's let's wait fifteen minutes. <laughs> Thirty thousand enemy is nothing. Thirty thousand soldiers Come with on. you is nothing right. compared to the challenge that they were up against. Right. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. And yet. For God, he had a different perspective about the 30,000. Right. In Judges 7, starting in verse 1. Early in the morning, Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley in the hill of Moriah. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands, or Israel would boast against me, my own strength saving. Now announce to the army, anyone who trembles in fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So, so here, Gideon is like, only 30,000 guys? This is ridiculous. Okay, we're going to have to send everybody back to their village and like re the horn here. But God steps in and he goes, you have too many. You got too many people. I want you to tell them that anyone who's afraid can go home. Now the Bible says, do not be afraid. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. So if you are, then you're in sin. Are you with me? Yeah. It's normal to have a, a um, apprehension in a difficult situation. But, but to give in to discouragement is sick. That's right. Are you right? Yeah. 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 And so, so he goes to the, the army of Israel, 30,000, tiny army. And he goes, hey guys, I imagine him saying something like, guys, I know none of you are terrified. Right. And, and, and there's not a single coward among you. Amen. But God has let me know that, that if a few of you maybe are afraid, you could go. But, 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 but I got to believe that none of you are afraid. Come on. 22,000 men left. Oh, wow. Well, 10,000 remained. Wow. 
So now he's got 10,000 guys up against all the Midianites. He goes, God is going to work an incredible miracle. He's going to bring down 50 million angels. It is going to be awesome. God, God can do this with, with 10,000? Amen. I believe it. 10,000. Good. But the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I will thin them out for you there. If I say this one shall go, he shall go. But if I say this one shall not go, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water, and there the Lord told him, Separate those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog laps from those who kneel down to drink. Three hundred of them drank from cupped hands, lapping like dogs. All the rest got down on their knees. To drink. So, so here he's got 10,000 guys. God says, I'm going to thin these people out for you. And so when you're standing by a river and you're watching down the whole course, because people tend to like all get close to the water, right? That there's not like 50 people in line to get the water. If there's a long river, they all kind of get in line. So if you're at the front, you can look down and clearly see the actions of almost everybody. And, and he goes, okay, guys, drink. And, a, and the vast majority of people like throw themselves in the water and stick their head in the water like dogs and blah, 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 and get water. <laughs> Only 300 guys, which would have been clearly able to see the 300, remember that uh, we're in a war and kneel down with their spear, keeping their eye out for their brother and drink properly. God goes, those are your, those are your 300. So now, so now Gideon is down to 300 guys. Are you with me? Yeah. And God goes, perfect. You know, brothers and sisters, nothing has changed. God still only wants the committed few. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. God, God still only wants the radicalized, radical few. Right. Those who fully give their heart to him. You were chosen. Yeah. Many people are called, but then God finds a way to go, hey, if you're a scary cat or you're sad to time, you can go home. Right. Oh, and and it's sad, to, but the truth that many who have come have since gone home because they got scared at times yeah. and they got sad to face <laughs> and they stopped depending on God. Come on, right. And God, God goes, good. Because I only want the committed few who are going to totally give their heart to me. No. You know, the, Bible, the Bible doesn't say, you know, if the time of testing comes, yada, yada, yada. It says, when the time of testing comes. A time of testing has come for many of us, will come again. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. Every single person is going to get tested. And when we get tested, God is the best at this. Yeah. When God tests you, you will be tested. Oh, yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. He doesn't like half test you. Oh, no. He's not like just trying to figure this thing out. No, he's got it down to a science. Yeah. And if your heart is not fully invested, let me tell you right now, you will not make it. You might think you might wing it through. This is not your great three math test, my Come friend. On. You will not wing it by studying on the school bus on the way in. This is going to be a zinger of a test. Yeah. It's going to test not only your thoughts, but your attitude. Come on. You're, you're going to, you might have your head again going in this test, right. but you haven't gone down and, and got your heart right for this Come test. On. Come on. Are you with me? But here's, here's what I know. God is always going to have a tiny, committed few. All right, well. that's, that's the standard that we hold to in this church and in this movement. Yeah. We, we are interested in baptizing disciples. Yeah. Not people who promise to one day be a disciple. Yeah. Come on. Right. Hey, do you believe in sharing your faith? Come on. Right. Sure. Right. <laughs> Will you give? Financially? Something? Missions? Yeah. yeah. What's that? I don't know, but cool. <laughs> no, no, no. We're, we're looking for people who walk the walk right now. Yeah. 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 We gotta honor God. 
And let me tell you something, it's very interesting, very interesting fact. You up the standards and it's amazing who shows up. Yeah. People who want to do great things in their life. Yeah. When, I was in, when I was in college, I had a job which was a promoter of a, of a club called Tokyo Lounge. <laughs> and uh, my night was Thursday night. This is me as a non disciple <laughs> My night was Thursday night, and it was dead as a doornail. The old, I was a bartender, and the uh, the club owner said, "Hey, you, do you want Thursday night? You seem to have a lot of clients and friends and whatever. Like, Thursday night scores, man. Make a cranking party." I go, "Thursday night's terrible here. It's dead. Because you can do whatever you want. Are you sure? Yeah, you can do whatever you want. So." I got with some of my friends and we made a, a guest list. Right. So these are the only people invited. There's going to be a doormat at the door, you will not let anyone else in. If anyone is not dressed like this, they, 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 they cannot come in. Are you with me? Right. So of the whole street of clubs, you got one club with a doormat and a little fence right. and nobody's allowed in unless they're on the little roster. Right. Guess what happens? Everybody wants it. Yeah. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah. So then we started to open it up. We said, okay, if, it, if you're on the guest list or you meet the proper dress specifications, then you can come in. Right. People literally started going home and getting changed. Come on. I, I couldn't believe this was one of the hardest things for me in my Catholic cost. Is by the time we were done, that place was packed with 1,200 people every night. Wow. Wow. While I was studying the Bible, while I was doing discipleship study, while I was doing right. the word study, while I was doing kingdom study, yeah. the brother who was studying the Bible with me came out to the club, oh, no. yeah. saw it, yeah. just like normal, yeah. came out, saw it, yeah. didn't say boo to me that night, yeah. just gave me a hug. Yeah. Next day in the Bible study, he goes, dude, that is the most godless, horrible place I've ever seen in my entire life. You, you, you cannot work there anymore. Right. This was my livelihood. Yeah. Right. So you know how you start to negotiate? Yeah. Right. Right. I go, I agree with you. It is wrong. Yeah. So that's why I would like to propose that I just keep doing it all summer. Right. And then I'll be Come set on. up for the school year. Right. No. <laughs> and I think actually he was a little intimidated by me, so he said no to me and then left his own house. Like, no, you think about this. <laughs> I, I would have been like, think about this, go for a walk. Yeah. I'm staying at my house. Yeah. 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 He left his own house, left me in the house. <laughs> he comes back 15 minutes later, I go, dude, I could have given you your answer right away. I will never talk to those people again. I will never go back to that place. I quit, I'm gone, I'm done, I'm all of them. I hope you enjoyed the walk. Line yeah. on the camp. And they look down 
And, and Gideon somehow gives a signal. And all together as one, they take the jar that they have, you follow? Yeah. And they got the, the, the torch inside, they smash the jar with the torch. Right. You follow? Yeah. Smash. Now what happens? The, the blazing fire of the torch now becomes visible to everybody. Right. You follow me? Yeah. And then they go, a sword for the Lord and a sword for Gideon. The only problem being, there's no mention of actual swords being present. Right. Yeah. Are you with me? Right. And so, without a sword, with only a torch and the trumpet, they blow on the trumpet. Right. Now, you got 300 guys surrounding this camp. From a military perspective, okay, you always have somebody with a trumpet and somebody with a, a signaling torch, usually for about every thousand guys wow. at this time. You follow me? Yeah. Yeah. So for the Midianites down in the camp, looking up, they see 300 guys with trumpets and 300 guys with torches. So what do they think? There must be at least 300,000 in. Are you with me? They, they, and then it's dark. You see the 300 torches. You hear the 300 trumpets. You're like, this is a huge army up there. And then suddenly someone bangs in. And then someone says, they're already among us. <laughs> and then someone pulls their sword out and just stabs somebody for the heck of it. Just to you know, get scared. And then someone goes, one of them just stabbed me. And this entire army hacked themselves to pieces. Is that incredible? Yeah. And the Bible says that only a tiny number of them survived to escape and run like scaredy cats. You know, we look at this and go, wow, that is, that is extremely interesting. I mean, torches and jars and whatever. That's cool, man. You just wasted 15 minutes of my life that I'm never going to get back. Right. What's the Bible application? Yeah. Well, I'm glad you asked. Okay. Let's take a look in 2 Corinthians 4. Come on. All right. Come on. In 2 Corinthians 4, starting verse 3. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and make ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Christ, so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. Wow. Come on. What, what does this say? Uh -oh. it, says, it says that the torch is inside the jar. Wow. The torch is the face of Christ in our hearts. That's awesome. Are you with me? Yeah. It's the face of Christ. It's our, it's our faith. It's a hope in Jesus that's that's in our hearts, right. but it's contained within a, a jar, which is ourself, right. yeah. our body. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. And it says we have to be handed over to death. We've got we've to gotta smash the jar oh, yeah. so that the light of Christ becomes seen to the entire world. 
And when the light, when we, when we die to ourselves and show that trumpet, show that, that light, yeah. and blow that trumpet with all of our hearts, then the entire world is going to be thrown into a people and we're going to see numbers, things, plantings that will blow our socks off. Come on. But, but if you only have this, if we truly break the job. What, what are the things that need to break in your life? Come on, bro. To make this truly the summer of impossible love. Because you know when you get baptized, it's like, hey, I give my whole life to God. I'm giving everything I have over to God. And, and what you have usually is nothing. <laughs> right? So usually all this life, supposedly, that you're giving to God is nothing. Right? But then God starts to give you stuff. God gave me a crank in marriage. To an incredible woman. Let's be honest, out in the world, I would never have a wife like this. It's, it's true. I buy it. God is generous. God is good. She looked at the heart. Praise God. <laughs> um, <laughs> but now suddenly there's stuff that gets in the way of having that summer of impossible love because I don't have time to share my faith I don't have time to reach out I don't have time to get myself a guest on, at church on Sunday because, because if I do that will affect my life which incidentally is what God gave me yeah. are you with me? yeah Brothers and sisters, we're not, I'm not, I'm not throwing scriptures up here for the purpose of just inspiring you to go home and think nice thoughts. <laughs> On your seats here, we have two Hi. things. The Crown of Thorns Project and an Operation Eagle. Come on. Are you with me? Yeah. These plans cannot happen. If we do not break the jar and let Christ's light shine in our life. Are you with me? Yeah. Already. I mean, those of us who've been around from the beginning, already. I mean, who remembers when this thing was like pretty much totally red? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Kip was audacious. I'm like, just put less names, bro. I mean, if it's all red, it's, it's discouraging. But like, we can add names as we go. He goes, no, no, no. We're, we're going to put them out there so people can pray for them. Come on. And yet it was all red. Yeah. Then purple started to creep in as, as revenue groups started to be formed. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. Yeah. And now, guys, I don't know. For, for those who maybe haven't been around very long, it, it doesn't maybe have the same impact. But every time I look at this thing, Man. my heart sinks. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I, I look at it. Like right now, I'm going to look at it. My heart feels better. Right. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Every single one of these green little words here represents yeah. a powerful yeah. church of sold out disciples. <laughs> and this is even all of you. This summer at the GLC, we're going to plant Hong Kong, China. <laughs> and then comes this part. Come on. Yeah. Come on, Eagle. Come on. Operation Eagle. Right. When we go into Indiana, and, and we, when we're sharing our faith, like a lot of religious churches do, and, and we're standing next to your local evangelistic, uh, evangelical uh, pastor, and we go, hey, we want to go to all nations. He's going to go, we, we want to go to all nations too. Yeah. No, you didn't understand. We're not trying to go to all nations. We're in India right now. We're in China right now. Now, a lot of people fought Kip about this because they said it's too expensive to go to the whole world first. Let's go to America first, get some money, and then go to the whole world. But, but I think that that would have been a, a horrible mistake because we would have been going across America talking about something that we haven't done. Right. Now we're going to be planting churches across America talking about something that God has done. Brothers and sisters, this book was handed to us by the loving hands of our forefathers, our brothers and sisters, yeah. who gave their lives so that we could have it today. Yeah. 
It's an important story. It's God trying to reach us and tell us our story. Each one of you are mighty warriors. But we've never, never give up the charge to radicalize everybody. Because they're going to get tested anyways. Are you with me? And the only way to complete this plan, I wish that there was a cooler way or a more technical way or a website or an app that could do this for us. But there's not. It's to break the chart. It's to get rid of everything in our life that prevents this week from being the most evangelistic week that we've ever had. Come on, man. So that wherever we go this week, people see the face of Christ. They see the fire of Christ. They see hope for a lost and broken world. That's who you are, the mighty warriors. I love you guys very much. Let's go after this with the fight like it's the fight of our life because I want to tell you right now, it is. I love you guys very much. Guys, is that awesome or not? Yeah. I just think we need to kind of implement the uh, Tokyo Club plan right here. Where you gotta dress up and be sold out just to get here in the building. And we'll find a long line waiting to become a part of God's new sold out movement, Metro High Treatment. Amen, hey, guys? Tim, that was a, a terrific job, as always, dear brother. Um, Maybe the big challenges I, I, I got from this is, uh, number one, you got to look at the heart. Yeah. Thank God we did. Come on. <laughs> it's got to look at your heart. Yeah. It's a beautiful heart for God. Yeah. If not, it's time to repent. Yeah. When you repent, Tim gave us the challenge. Five impossible kingdom dreams. Write them down. Come on. How's that accomplished? Break the jar. Break the jar and let God's light shine. Are you with me? So Tim alluded to some terrific things that are going to be happening. Um, the red is becoming purple. Just in the past two weeks, we have two more remnant groups in America. In Ann Arbor, Michigan, and Indianapolis, Indiana. And excitingly, yes, Hong Kong is going out at the TLC in just a couple weeks. And yes, Miami's going out in just a couple weeks. And yes, the Moon Philippines is going out in a couple weeks. And just this past week, we added another church planting to Guam. Amen, guys? It's been an awesome day at church. I've been told by Brother Princeton we have to be out of here at 12.30. But on the other hand, I think we have time for one more song. We have the singing baptism to come on up here. And Jay Hayes is going to lead us in. Go! Make disciples! Let's stand! Press the aisles, And let's sing as we go out of the building. Come on, Wendy. Alright, let's open our song book to song 214. Go and make disciples. Come on. Well, he said, he said to go.